thanks for having me. I am from Berkeley, and it's not my fault. I just want to start with that. Um, this is actually the second time in the last two and a half weeks uh, that our campus is shut down. Last time it was for three days. I hope it doesn't happen again. Um, what I'll be talking about today, uh, I'm, I'm going to use the term blockchain on my last slide because I feel like I have to. Uh, but uh, I think I fall under that umbrella of what Stephanie referred to as people working in a space that's somewhat adjacent and, and what I have been following in this uh, arena uh, suggests that indeed there may be some interesting developments along the lines of uh, blockchain and uh, reviews and reputation. So, so let me start with uh, what I'll say is my quote-unquote theory slide. Um, there are many economic papers written over the past uh, let's say three to three and a half decades uh, that formalize ideas of reputation and, and feedback. Uh, but really, I think you could sum it up in, uh, in, in three lines. Uh, first of all is the issue of trust. Um, in a world where everything is enforceable, uh, there doesn't have to be trust, right? So if Guido and I agree on a certain transaction, on a certain gain from trade, and somehow that could be recorded and enforceable so that if he doesn't deliver the good or I don't pay him, one of us gets shot, everybody's going to uh, um, honor their transactions and there's not going to be a problem. However, in a world without that, there's this thing we call trust uh, that I think when we uh, pause for a second and think about it. It's a lot less about math and a lot more about what we feel here in the middle of our tummy, uh, even though some evolutionary psychologists suggest that that's all evolved from uh, pretty sophisticated math. So uh, we, could, we could have our different views on that. Um, and, and the key to reputation is just a very old idea that understanding uh, that what goes around comes around. If I behave well, people are going to update their beliefs about me. Oh, you know, Steve seems like a more trustworthy person. They'll be more likely to be willing to engage with me. And as long as I maintain that level of, uh, of good service, of commitment, of, uh, of um, following up on my word, then that strong idea of reputation is going to sustain my ability to interact with other people. Um, and again, this has been modeled either through repeated games or through Bayesian games. There, there are different ways to put this into math, but I think the conceptual idea is pretty straightforward and universal. And at the heart of it is, is information, information about past behavior. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if I look here in the audience, I've known Richard probably for about 10, 15 years, 10 more. I think. And, you know, we've interacted in conferences. And so th there's a certain knowledge we have about each other because we've, we've observed information of our past behavior, right? And through that, we could maintain this notion of, you know, how am I summarizing Richard in, you know, a sentence about how his past behavior, and that's based on the information that I have. If we think about uh, transactions, and in particular online transactions, then, then reviews are going to be one of the main sources of information, and the question is, to what extent are they truthful? Um, now, th the nice thing is, over the years, um, and, and there's actually someone here who's a, a student in a class that I just finished teaching at Berkeley, um, one of my most famous lines is from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, and I'm not so much of a religious person. And the line goes, uh, you know, what has been will be, what has been done will be done, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, these ideas have been around for a very long time. Uh, uh, there's very nice work by a couple of my former colleagues at Stanford, Abner Greif, Paul Milgram, uh, together with other folks, that show that these ideas of recording transactions, looking at past history, and using those as indicators of how trustworthy you are, uh, this goes back hundreds of years. Uh, either in the Maghrabi traders uh, of, the, uh, of North Africa, where people would travel for uh, hundreds of miles and trade with other people that they don't know personally, but they know through their network of connections, and whenever a trade would go wrong, the information in the system would diffuse so that other people knew, oh, this person just screwed someone, next time around you have to do that. Or the trade fairs of, uh, of medieval Europe where people would come to these marketplaces in certain geographies and, uh, and then transact, and there would be people who would record transactions, who's from which tribe, from which village, from which city, uh, so basically people carried that. 
And now those trade fairs, uh, which used to be geographic locations that people would congregate to, are now eBay and Amazon Marketplace and Taobao. And it's basically the same thing, just in a different uh, uh, costume. Uh, so, um, so there really is nothing new under the sun. But the online world did uh, uh, offer a very a concise way of trying to distill the information from these transactions and put them uh, in one place. So I'm going to use some examples from eBay primarily, and then I'll talk about something uh, that I dabbled with uh, using Taobao data. Um, and eBay really is the pioneer. So if, if you think about you know, marketplaces, 1995, eBay was really the first marketplace. Um, and and for, for students or, or scholars of innovation and, uh, and development over time, I think the big puzzle is how come eBay never understood that they invented a relatively new business model and then let 20 other companies use that idea and do it much better. Uh, but you know, that, that's a, a different story. Uh, so, so here is a page from a typical eBay uh, uh, listing. You see here an Apple 13.3-inch uh, MacBook Pro, and it is sold by this seller called Electronics Valley, okay? And this is the reputation information, so to speak, all condensed here. Let me just blow this up, okay? So here's a seller, Electronics Valley. You have a number over here, 21,814. Uh, that is the reputation score, which is calculated as positive feedback minus negative feedback. So every time someone said, you know, thumbs up or plus, that counter goes up. Every time someone says negative, right, or thumbs down, the counter goes down. And you look at the uh, percent positive, which is just the number of positives divided by positives plus negatives, it's 99.2. Here you have another uh, element that is interesting. This is a badge that eBay decides to give sellers based on their reading of past performance. So this is user generated and this is eBay or marketplace platform generated. Um, and you could click on this and then see even more detailed information on, on different uh, ways in which people gave them feedback. Now, <clears throat> I remember when I started getting uh, uh, more enthused about eBay and would buy things here and there, and I would kind of look at the reputation, and, and that was an important indicator for me, right? Am I willing to trust this seller or not? Well, that's going to be a function of their reputation. And when I go and I see 99.2%, well, here's what I know. In most uh, types of reviews or evaluations, when I look at scales, 99.2% is a pretty big number, right? I think of all my colleagues at Berkeley with Nobel Prizes and all sorts of other uh, uh, great honors, and I kind of ask around, nobody ever had a GPA of 99. You know, 96, some of them, 89, most of them, right? 99.2, that, that's, that's really impressive. Uh, now, in the world of eBay, this is what the distribution of feedback actually looks like. And this is from data uh, that was pulled in uh, 2012, uh, and things have not changed much. Uh, in red, uh, which is hidden behind the blue, is unweighted by transactions. And in blue, it's weighted by dollar transactions. Let me tell you what you see here. You're seeing here the distribution of percent positive on eBay. Now, I just want to point out that I started the graph at 98%. Right? There's really no point in going down to zero. And as you could see, most people are sitting up here literally at 100%. So in fact, if you look at the unweighted, okay, more than 60% of sellers have a score of 100%. And um, the mean is 99.3%. So 99.2 is not that uh, great. And the uh, 10th percentile is 97.8%. There's really not a lot of information here. Now, of course, when you see that, you could start forming an opinion of what world does eBay live in and represent. On one hand, maybe it's utopia. Anyone who's not brilliant and perfect gets kicked off the site and they cease to exist. And on the other hand, maybe it's a dystopia where really feedback is heavily biased and the signal to noise ratio in information on reputation is practically zero. Um, and, um, and I'll talk about a little bit of research that suggests it's a little more dystopia than it is uh, utopia. Now, uh, this is not just eBay. Um, I think uh, the most uh, trusted source for scholarship is uh, um, 
X XKCD, I don't know how many of you follow their uh, cartoons, right? Five stars, has only one review, four and a half excellent, four okay, and everything else is crap. Um, and I think that this is uh, not only verified by some of the research I did at eBay, but there are others. For example, uh, there's a, a very recent uh, nice paper by Apostolus Horton and Golden, uh, working paper, uh, where they look at uh, data from an online labor market, basically think of a freelance type uh, market, and, uh, and they show reputation inflation is something that happens even over time. Um, there's an older paper by uh, Giorgio Zervas and Prosperio and Byers uh, where the title says it all. A first look at online reputation at Airbnb where every stay is above average, right? The Lake Wobegon effect. Um, and this is something that predominantly people are starting to accept as truth. That there is a tremendous amount of bias upward in these online reputations, which, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so if I want to take a step back and say, we have this electronic marketplace with an electronic version of something that we as humans have used for hundreds if not thousands of years, namely some record keeping of what people did and using that record keeping to form some belief in our minds of whether this is someone we want to trust in a transaction or not. Um, it is a wonderful idea, however, it seems to have some uh, challenges and problems. And, and here are the four that I think summarize most of what people have identified or have raised as concerns. The first is the great inflation problem. I already talked about that. The second is the public good problem. Um, and namely, if I think of myself as a well-trained economist who believes in economics, then every time I buy something online, I shouldn't leave review. Why should I leave a review? Well, it costs me anywhere from five to 20 seconds, and the benefit for me is nothing because as a good economist, I don't give a shit about you, and the only thing that my uh, review is doing, it's helping you, right? So in that sense, uh, there's a notion in which uh, you shouldn't see uh, reputation uh, being given. Now, mind you, thank goodness, most people are not economists. Um, back in eBay's heyday, even the first 10 years, surprisingly more than 80% of people left some kind of feedback. And even when I left eBay uh, in 2015, um, I, I was there full-time from 2011 to 2013, and then part-time after I went back to Berkeley, uh, you still had about half the people leaving feedback. Mind you, not super useful feedback given how skewed it was. Uh, but we, if we think there is a lot of information and maybe even more accurate information in some people who don't leave feedback, then we have this public goods problem where people don't have the incentives to leave feedback. Another big problem that these online reputation systems are, are delivering is what I would call the cold start problem. Uh, so what's the cold start problem? Imagine I'm a new seller to a marketplace, and in that marketplace, Stephanie is already an established seller, and she has great reputation. Now you show up, and you see Stephanie Inc. with uh, this tremendous reputation, and then Steve and company with no reputation. Well, are you willing to take that risk? And the question is, could I get you to take that risk with a lower discount, right, if I maybe sell for less? And what is the premium that Stephanie could charge over me? So you get this issue of a barrier to entry. Once you have enough established sellers, it's going to be hard for new sellers to come in. Um, and uh, finally, we have the issue of fraud. Sellers can create fraudulent reviews. We know this is a topic uh, that's been explored both in uh, academic uh, worlds and as well as in practice. And, and the question is basically, how could marketplace platforms use design and engineering to address uh, these challenges? Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about you know, one, two, and three and, and I'm really not going to have much to say about fraud, uh, where the name of the game here is basically apply some kind of ML AI algorithm, try to detect what's fraud and hope that it works. And it's really a cat and mouse game because once you identify certain patterns, then the fraudsters learn what those patterns are, try to work around them, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and one of the things that I'm wondering, as I'll say in the last slide, is whether blockchain may have some way of improving uh, not only fraud, but some of these other things. So um, in particular, there's, there's the sentence that was written now 
more than 15 years ago that I absolutely fell in love with about seven years ago when I was at eBay. Uh, Al Roth is a very well-known economist at Stanford now. Uh, he is one of the winners of the Nobel Prize uh, for his work on matching markets. Uh, and, uh, and he wrote the following in a paper in 2002 um, years before uh, he was recognized for his work, uh, market designers cannot work only with the simple conceptual models used for theoretical insights into the general working of markets. Instead, market design calls for an engineering approach. And I just want to pause here for a second because there are a handful of other economists in the room. What we've typically done as economists is, you know, looked at the world. The world is complicated, right? Take what we think is an essential problem, peel off as much as we can in order to reach some nice tractical model that looks like, you know, E equals MC squared, right? A little bit of notation, a little bit of math, but that gains some insight into this problem. And, and many times uh, the emphasis is more on the elegance of the model and the generality of the model and a lot less is on how do we take this and actually put it into a system that will improve outcomes and uh, and and here we get into the you know am i getting it 99.9% .9 accurate and beautiful but implementation is difficult or am i getting 80% right and now let me try to implement something and, uh, and I think one of the nice uh, things that's happening with economists who are moving into tech uh, is getting more of that economic engineering, using economic insights, but then applying them as a proof of concept to some kind of application that actually works. Uh, and and in, in that sense, there are three complementary ways in which the economics ideas from the research that me and many others have done, uh, could be applied uh, to improve on those problems that I mentioned earlier. And there really are three complementary approaches taking into account that feedback is user-generated content. And that's critical. And why do I pause there? Because if we want to understand the quality of feedback and other data that goes into the system, we have to understand what the data generating process is. How, how is that data created? And in particular, with feedback, it's user-generated. And users are people, and people have incentives. And therefore, we need to understand the incentives of people in order to understand the quality of the reputation and then see how we could either improve on it or find other ways to uh, kind of distill information or signal from that noise. So, so the three complementary approaches that I'm going to talk about today, um, and, and here I'm just citing, you know, work that my name is in, because that's the stuff I know the most. There are many other uh, people who are working on related topics. Uh, so, you know, this is just a, a set of vignettes, so to speak. Um, one is the idea of certification, which I won't talk about in detail. And that's what I showed you with that badge that eBay says, trusted seller, right? So the marketplace may have a lot more information that's not that easy to distill into a number, and instead of giving you a number, maybe the marketplace could say, hey, here is someone who is above the line in some way. Or here is someone who's in the A-team category, and here's the Bs, and here are the Cs. Um, one, I think, big advantage of this approach is that it takes away from the user the need to interpret what a number means. Right? So when I show you four stars, does everybody treat four stars the same way? What does four stars exactly mean? Versus a platform that says, this is a trusted seller. You will not be disappointed. So, so there are some ways in which having that paternalistic approach might actually be efficient. Um, another paternalistic approach uh, is not even to show you anything, but rather to decide for you who are the sellers that you should look at. Okay. Um, and again, what this would, uh, would do, it would take your need as a user, um, take away your need to try to infer something from data that is incomplete. And finally, uh, leveraging economics in, in, in a very uh, economic way of creating markets, uh, creating markets to create some way in which better sellers will be able to distinguish themselves from uh, sellers that are not that good. And, uh, and let me dive quickly into uh, each one of these. 
So, so let me start with the first, uh, um, well, it was the second one on the slide, creating these paternalistic ways for the platform to uh, identify better sellers and match them with buyers. So, so if you recall, the, average, the um, median percent positive was 100%. And, and that's not very informative. And now we, we gave this a bunch of thought, and, and what we realized is that a lot of people may not be leaving feedback, especially when things are not that great. And we found a few cool anecdotes. For example, uh, there was a student in, uh, from Colorado State University uh, just about a decade ago uh, who bought a bicycle on eBay, had it sent over, the bicycle was not what he expected. It wasn't exactly what the seller said. I don't remember if it was broken or, or some other problem with it. And that buyer, that student, left the seller negative feedback, okay? Which makes sense, given the transaction. Now, the seller had the student's name and address and phone number because they ship it, right, and it has to get there. And the student started getting messages on his phone, something like, oh, are you playing games with me? I'm gonna follow you till your grave, right, from the buyer, from the seller. Now you read that in the newspaper and you think, yeah, I just bought this item on eBay. It's not that great. Do I want to leave negative feedback? No. Okay. Um, and even if it's not that extreme, what about just those nagging emails you get from the seller after the fact of, you know, why did you leave me negative feedback? You're really hurting me. You know, my children are going to starve. And, and you know, what's, what's the point? So one of the uh, thoughts we had, and, and it turned out that there was some earlier research that Chris De La Rocas, uh, who's also done a lot of work uh, from BU on online marketplaces, uh, explored, uh, and, and that is whether there is information in silence. Okay, so if I think back at the homo economicus model, you know, you have schmucks like me who never leave feedback, and then most other people who are somewhat nicer and they leave feedback. So in that sense, there's going to be randomness in who leaves feedback and who doesn't, which may be orthogonal or unrelated to the experience. Now, if that's the case, then the information and feedback is going to be fine. Because say, if half the people who leave feedback are representative of the true distribution of the quality of the trade, and they are reporting truthfully, then I have fewer signals, but at least on average, they're right. However, what happens if those who choose to be silent are a different set of people. And this is the extent in which I mentioned earlier, understanding that this is user-generated content, putting yourself in the shoes of the user, and understanding in which way they will be biased is going to be important in order to unbias the signal. So the conjecture we had was that people who have bad experiences are more likely to just shut up than people who have good experiences based on that simple story of the guy with the bicycle and, and so on. Well, if that's the case, it means that silence is not random. Silence has more negativity than randomness. And therefore, we could create a new measure that we'll call effective percent positive, where we're going to put the number of positive feedback in the top, just like eBay does, but instead of feedback in the denominator, we're going to put total transactions, which means we're adding silence. And this would be an example of the comparison. Here's seller A and seller B both have exactly one negative feedback and 99 positives. On eBay system, they would look identical. They would have a percent positive of 99%. However, what if A had 20 silent and B had 50 silent? Then our measure is gonna say that A has an effective percent positive of 82.5 while B has 66 and clearly would rank them differently. Um, and if our conjecture is true, seller A is a higher quality seller than seller B. Now, there are two things we need to do in order to prove that this is at all useful. First of all, show that there's more signal than noise in this metric. And second, convince you that this metric is a metric of quality and not some random number that is meaningless in terms of economics. So uh, first, the signal to noise ratio. This is the distribution of EPP, okay? suddenly it actually looks like a distribution and not like a hockey stick. Um, the uh, uh, mean and median are close to about 65%. The standard deviation was about 14%. So it, it really looked like a signal of, of use. Now, the second question is, does it really measure quality? 
And the answer is yes. And here, again, we brought economic insight into this engineering problem. And, and what do I mean by that? Without kind of showing you the uh, statistical model that's behind it, but it's straightforward. Um, think of a user's behavior as a function of the transaction that they just engaged in. Now, I think most of you would agree that if I'm buying something on any platform and I'm a happy camper, I'm more likely to come back to that platform than if I'm not a happy camper. So for those computer scientists in the room, think of it as a classification problem, right? And for the economists in the room, just think of it as a discrete choice problem, which is the same thing, right? My Y variable is a zero or one. Do I come back or do I not come back? And my X variables are a whole bunch of measures, including the effective percent positive. And the nice thing is that buyers don't see the effective percent positive, so they can't quote unquote select on it. And again, for the handful of economists here, sample selection is always a problem in trying to uh, uh, convince someone that you're measuring a causal relationship. So we really did find that when buyers engage with sellers that have a higher EPP, they are more likely to come back to eBay. And in a significant way, more than most other metrics that are in the data. So uh, what we then did is uh, run a, a little experiment um, that ended up being quite successful with that following paternalistic approach. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, this is what a typical eBay search would look like. Now when you search MacBook Air, right, eBay's algorithm is going to decide what to show you. The same is true for Amazon or Taobao or any other marketplace. What goes into that algorithm? A whole bunch of inputs, like you know, price and description and so on and so forth. Um, most of these algorithms are designed, typically now through a machine learning algorithm, to train on conversion, right? Where the idea is the following. If this is something that is going to meet your needs, you're more likely to buy it and convert than if it's something that doesn't meet your needs. And therefore, if I am targeting conversion as my metric in the machine learning algorithm, then I am becoming better and better at showing you what you like. Well, conversion is one thing. The second thing, you got that sucker at home. Are you happy with it? And then if you're not, the likelihood of coming back is going to drop. So now we realize that ML algorithm is not really trading off long-term platform health, but rather short-term conversion. So what we were able to do is convince uh, the folks at eBay to play with that algorithm and put some weight on the EPP. So for example, if this would be the regular algorithm and number four now has a higher EPP than the folks in front, maybe number four will jump up to three or two, or maybe even one depending on the strength of that difference. And we ran that A-B test and, and we did show that it had very strong impacts on the likelihood of customers returning to eBay within three to six months. So, so this shows you that there is information in this hidden data. Now I'm gonna pause here for a second and say, <clears throat> this may be very specific to eBay, but as a proof of concept, I want to emphasize that so-called scientific slash engineering framework. Understanding why the reputation may be biased. Oh, silence. What could we do with silence? Oh, create a metric. What could we do with the metric, rank sellers? What's the best way of delivering it? We believe in this paternalistic way. Because you could see what would happen if alternatively we did the following. eBay would make an announcement, percent positive, not a lot of information. We have a new metric, it's called effective percent positive, or you know, maybe hire McKinsey, they'll come up with a better name. Uh, they're, they're good at that. Um, and, uh, and then use that name and educate buyers that now you have a better metric to choose your sellers. Now you're a seller, you sold something, and the buyer didn't leave you feedback. What do you do? You know that's working against you. You're gonna hammer them with emails. My kids are gonna die. You have to leave me a feedback. What's gonna happen? All these people are just gonna start leaving positive feedback because they don't wanna be schmucks, and what happened to the EPP metric? it lost its signal to noise ratio. So there may be ways in which it's in the interest of the platform not to reveal what they're using because anytime you reveal what you're using, you're gonna let people engineer around that that goes against the platform's best interest. 
Um, let me use a, another uh, vignette um, to identify other ways in which we could find quote unquote hidden information in the data that is going to be useful to, uh, um, oh, okay, I, I didn't notice how bad I was with uh, using the time. Uh, so, so let me tell you in a second, because I, I, I will have to wrap up. Um, another thing we found is people send emails to sellers almost 9% of the time after the transaction. Why would anybody sell the seller an email after a transaction? Are people just saying, thank you, you made my day? No economist would believe it. Interestingly, some people do, okay? Hello, good morning, I'm glad to tell you the two items arrived, so I'm very happy, thanks a lot. Okay, good for this person. I'd like them to uh, marry one of my boys, but uh, not, not much of an economist. More typical, you know, one I received, one I haven't received. What we did is use an NLP bag of words type of approach to identify negative content emails, then use those to predict how happy a buyer would be based on their return to eBay, and lo and behold, found another metric, which is the, uh, the amount of negativity you have in emails, this is uh, scaled at the seller level, to create a predictor of how bad that seller is going to be, which is another input you could use into uh, ranking. Um, and I'm going to conclude with uh, just one uh, quick story on something we did at Taobao um, that I think is going to uh, be a little more familiar to the economists in the room, um, and, and that is the following. Um, let me actually uh, keep it on, on this slide. Um, I'm a new buy seller. I come to a marketplace. I can't sell anything because I don't have any reputation. What if I pay people for reputation? I say, hey, if you buy from me and leave me reputation, I'm going to give you a buck. Okay? Now, if I could, of course, manipulate that, meaning if you buy from me and leave me positive reputation, I'll give you a buck, that's going to be useless. If I say I will pay you regardless of whether you leave me positive or negative, now an interesting set of economics comes in, which is signaling and equilibrium selection, because if I'm a bad seller and I anticipate that when you leave me feedback it's going to be negative, I don't want to say I'm going to pay you a dollar for it. But if I'm a good seller and I expect the reputation to be positive, I will be willing to pay you that dollar. Now the only thing is we need to separate who pays from who receives because I only want to pay you if you leave me positive feedback. But what if the platform could commit to pay you regardless of the feedback? And that's something that happened on Taobao. So on Taobao, they created this feedback mechanism where they used NLP, again, to identify the value of content, and they paid people regardless of whether it was positive or negative, and sellers who used it ended up being quite a bit better. So I'm going to wrap up, and I'm going to jump to my, my last uh, point here about how blockchain technology could move the needle. As uh, Richard and I had dinner yesterday, as I told him, I've now seen enough and heard enough about blockchain that if I met a random person on the street, I could convince them that I know a lot about it, but I don't, okay? And maybe I will in a month or a year. The point is there's a lot of people selling a lot of promise, a lot of which I'm like, maybe, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced, but there are a few things that look interesting. For example, aggregating reputation across platforms. If I'm an eBay seller and I did really well and I go to a new platform, I have no reputation. Could there be some decentralized blockchain-like system that is able to pull from different places in order to create what, you know, people in China are talking about that, you know, social reputation metric that will go across platforms and help me leverage my good behavior in one arena towards another. Of course, what that's going to do is remove lock-in from current platforms, right? If I am now locked into this platform because this is where I have the reputation, it's hard for me to move, now that mobility uh, is going to be um, possible. And finally, fraudulent feedback, which all the companies are really struggling with. Is there some magic that blockchain could bring? I'm skeptical, but I would really like to know the answer to that question. And with this, I will end. Thank you. Thank you.